Well, we're coming now toward the end of our series on Revelation. Um, will be two more sermons on Revelation. The final sermon on chapter 22, uh, well, John Woods will give that. Uh, hopefully, you know, he'll do it live, face to face, flesh and blood. If not, then um, in any case, he'll record it and, and John will finish up the series of Revelation. And then what we're going to do before Christmas, you know, because of course Christmas is coming close for, for two Sundays, we're going to have a, a couple of sermons from the book of Daniel. Okay, and, and we're going to deal with that question of, okay, what does it actually look like for God's people to live in, you know, empire? We've been talking about these empires that are, in the book of Revelation, they come across as being all evil, they're the enemies of God. Um, but of course, Revelation kind of uses these symbolic images to communicate some truth about them, but the book of Revelation is not necessarily meant to tell us precisely what does it look like. You know, living in this world, in these different kinds of empires, whatever it might be. And so the book of Daniel is going to help us sort that out, because Daniel literally lived in Babylon, and literally served Babylon. Even though Daniel had similar visions that John had about how evil Babylon was, nevertheless, flesh and blood, he, he lived in Babylon and served the king of Babylon. And so what does that look like? So we're going to have a couple of sermons from the book of Daniel just to help us to think more concretely is, you know, how do we actually live in this world? So that's going to be probably the first two Sundays of December, uh, and then we'll have a few Sundays focusing on Christmas. More than likely what we're going to do is we start Christmas sermons and then move on into winter and spring is we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke. Okay, and so I hope you've kind of been reading the book of Revelation. It would be really nice if you read through it at least one more time before we finish this series. Uh, but then you might pick up the Gospel of Luke. And um, uh, one of the things we try to do here is every couple of years, you know, at least focus on Jesus in one of the Gospels. And we're going to do that then. <laughs> anyway, so... Those of you who have been around here for a while, you've seen this picture. If you're more or less new here, you might not have <coughs> seen this. Uh, this is an image that I often use to communicate a lot of different truths. Um, actually, I could have used it all through this Revelation series, but, but I haven't. But this is kind of a, a picture of where we are in God's timeline. With the coming of Jesus, kind of the kingdom, kingdom of God entered reality, this sort of new age started, uh, but kind of the strange thing is that the old days was still continuing on. Okay, and so the New Testament is this picture of how we're living in these two kingdoms at once. We're still living in this world, in this age, and we have to, but we're also kingdoms of heaven. Of course, that creates this tension that, that kind of explains our life. I mean, one of the reasons life is hard is because we are living in two worlds at once. Okay, and we're also living between the cross and the resurrection or the coming of Jesus, and that creates tension. With the coming of Jesus, a lot of new things enter reality, okay, but not everything has been fixed. So the Holy Spirit has come, we're filled with the Spirit, but we're still in these bodies that are subject to sickness and death. And so we live this tension of, you know, living part of the future, but not all of the future. In any case, this you know, this is the picture I often use to explain, you know, dynamics of how we live in this age. But one of the things when I use this picture, I never really talk about it much, is that that kind of explosion, you know, at the end of that green line, that sort of symbolizes the end of this age. Okay? And I've, I've purposely not given a lot of details about that, partially because, you know, there's a lot of different con uh, conceptions about about what is going on there. So that's just to symbolize the end of this age and the explosion kind of suggests that it, it's, it's not going to be like some sort of smooth process, but it's going to be a more cataclysmic, I can't speak English in any way, cataclysmic kind of event, you know, and so that explosion symbolizes that. But what all is involved in that? If you remember at the beginning of this series, um, I showed this chart, and this is one way in which some people read the book of Revelation. 
you know, where most of the book of, book of Revelation is in the future, and also it's mainly a chronological story that you can almost plot out, if not day by day, at least month by month, and all these events follow each other. Now, of course, I said then, we've kind of been saying along, you know, that is not the way in which we have been reading the book of Revelation in this series. Um, but this conception of Revelation, this timeline, all of that really is right there. Um, you know, what's interesting is in that timeline, that includes, for people who have that uh, interpretation, you know, seven years of tribulation, and then there's this thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth, and so at least one thousand seven, seven years are included in that one little moment on my timeline. So that's one way to, to kind of read this, but like I said, that's not, you know, that's not the approach that we've been taking in this series. We may have been emphasizing two things, and one is the importance of being a faithful witness. And this is kind of the takeaway for us, you know, what are we supposed to do? What does John want from us? What he wants from us is the same thing he wanted from those original readers 2,000 years ago, for them to be a faithful witness in their own context, you know, in very pagan surroundings where there wasn't a lot of support from society, you know, to be a follower of Jesus. He's saying, you've got to remain faithful, you've got to witness, you've got to be who you are, be willing to speak who you are. And you cannot speak of the allegiances of the world like Caesar is Lord, but rather Jesus is Lord, and that's your faithful witness. And in a sense, this final moment of the end of this age, and, and you know what John is communicating through these images is mainly that Jesus wins. And if the book of Revelation has any one central meaning or message, it's that Jesus wins. And the nice thing about this is, is this is true, and this is the emphasis on Revelation, even if we disagree about a lot of the details. You know, so if, if maybe along the way you disagree with some or a lot of what I've said, I hope we can agree that, that yes, John wants faithful witnesses. You know, whether he's thinking about future witnesses or us, this is what is expected of God's people, and we can agree the primary message of Revelation is Jesus wins. He wins. And of course, we can maintain our faithful witness because it's built on that claim that Jesus wins. <clears throat> but meanwhile, we're living in the here and now, and you know, this is kind of the, the title that I posted for this week, is some necessary tension. And, and, you know, none of us really want tension in our lives, I and mean, all of us have it. You know, the current circumstances create tension. You who are students, you're kind of living in this between time. You know, you have goals for life, you're not quite there, you still have to study, and that kind of thing, that creates tension. And, you know, I think about Charlie living here, you know, he's, his family's in Canada, and he's here for these months, and he's in this strange, I mean, you know, living in a hotel, that's... Maybe sometimes nice, but that's like, this isn't quite home. You know, and that just creates tension in life, and a lot of tension we want to get rid of, and a lot of tension is bad, and those of us who live with a lot of stress, you know, we know that, you know, even physically, tension takes a toll on us. But some tension is necessary. If we're living in these between times, there's some tension that is necessary, that we need to embrace, that we need to accept, so what I kind of want to talk about as we look at uh, chapters 19 and 20 of Revelation is this necessary tension. And the tension kind of comes because of um, two particular passages that we're going we're to look at today. So we're not going to be able to focus on all the details of Revelation 19 and 20, but especially the two ends of, of this particular section we're looking at is going to a create a kind of tension that we need to think through. But it's going to be a ne necessary kind of tension where we really don't want to let go of either end. Okay, I mean, if you think of two people pulling a rope, 
Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen like a tug of war match where there's two sides and you've got this big rope and they're all pulling. And you know, maybe you've seen it sometimes when one side says, we're all going to let go of the rope at the same time. And they do that and then all the other side just all go tumbling down. You know, we have to maintain this tension between these two sections. So in a moment we're going to look at these two ends of these two chapters and they're going to kind of have a different focus and we're going to have to try to find some way to in a sense focus on both of them that seems like when well, you can't focus on two things you've got to focus on one or the other we've got to try to find some way to keep both of these in our vision at the same time and not just let go of one of them we've got to find a way to hold on to that but before we get to that I want to talk a little bit about the story that happens in between the first part of chapter 19 and the last part of chapter 20. And once again, we're going to have this cast of characters. And so for several chapters, there's been a number of characters that John has brought onto the stage. You know, there, there's the woman, she is a child. And then there's the beast. Then another beast, which is a false prophet. And behind them was this dragon. And then, then there's Michael, he enters the stage. And there's different characters enter the stage, and once again, some of these same characters are now going to be on the stage in chapters 19 and 20, but they're going to be on the stage now only briefly, because in these chapters, a number of these characters are going to exit the stage, and they're not coming back on the stage, and so what John is telling us is about the end of the story for some of these characters. They've had their time, they've done their work, and it hasn't been good, it's been a battle, you know, there's warfare in heaven, they've been enemies of God's people and enemies of God. And they seem very powerful in that moment when they're on the stage, and John kind of puts them in the center of the stage, and there's a spotlight on them. And for a moment, it might seem like those characters are overwhelming, and maybe that's the main character of what's going on, but they're going to disappear. They're going to exit the stage, and they're not going to enter the stage again. It's the end of the story for them. As I've said before, the reason they're going to exit the stage is because another character is going to enter the stage. And when that character comes on stage, no one else can be there. He's such a character that he's going to clear the stage and everyone else is going to be gone. So in Revelation 19, in verse 11, John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. Okay, we've seen a white horse before. It's not the same white horse. It's not the same character. It symbolizes the same thing. The earlier white horse was one of the four horses, and, and the conqueror comes on his white horse. This is the, the empire, the king, who again rides the white horse, and it symbolizes it as a power. But he brings a different story in Revelation chapter 6. He brings death and famine and evil. Here's another character on a white horse. He's also a conqueror, but he's a different kind of conqueror. So here came, comes this white horse, and the rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. With justice, and that, that's the key, it's with justice. The other riders, they didn't bring justice. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him, that no one knows but he himself. This is kind of the language of Revelation. It's like, oh, this is a secret name that we can never know. John just says he has a name that no one knows for us to think. What is it? What is it? John is going to tell us exactly who he is. The, the name is actually going to be clear. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. Riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with, with which to strike down the nations. 
They will rule them with an iron scepter. This is Jesus, of course. This is the image of Jesus, who is Lord, and Jesus wins. And here we see that happening. So Jesus rides on the stage, and there's no room for anyone else when Jesus is on the stage. And so the, the, the next few verses have this image of, of a battle. Um, and of course, this again is some of the parts of Revelation that, that make people very uncomfortable. It creates tension, like a kind of tension, because you know, there's an image of armies coming in, you know, against Jesus, and then suddenly all these people seem to be dead, and their blood is running, and, and the birds are going to come and, and you know, eat their corpses up. And that makes people feel very, very uncomfortable. You know, what is this image of just judgment and destruction? But it's not the battle that you think it is. And it's not the battle that most people think it is. For one thing, there's no battle described. John doesn't describe any fighting at all. So it's a different kind of battle. It's a different kind of enemy that's going to be defeated in a different way. And so one of the significant details here is that um, the rider, as he rides on the horse, he has this sword coming out of his mouth. It's not in his hand, coming out of his mouth. His weapon is the Word of God. His weapon is truth. He's not literally killing people with the sword. He's defeating falsehood with truth. And he rides on, and, and uh, his robe is dipped in blood. And some people want to think, oh yeah, that's the blood of the enemies, but the battle hasn't even happened yet. Whose blood is it? It's his own. This is how Jesus wins. By dying. He conquers enemies. He conquers Satan by dying on the cross. And the cross was the defeat of Satan. On the cross was the defeat of all evil. And that's the image here. This is how Jesus wins this battle. And this is the end of Satan and all Satan's attempts. The death of Jesus accomplishes that, and then the Word of God, the living Word of God, that's what defeats the enemy. And so you have this image of, you know, but it's an image, it's a symbol of, you know, the, 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 the armies rise against God and then they're all defeated, but it's not literally people that he's slaying here. I mean, the, the, the judgment is going to be there, we're going to get to that in a second, but we shouldn't have it. The reason I'm saying this is because all through the history of the church, people take the imagery here, you know, of, of this warfare image, and I think this is what God's people are supposed to literally do. We're supposed to take up a literal sword or a literal gun, and that's how we have to defeat the enemies of God. And it's happened all through church history. And it's not the message of Revelation, that's not what John is trying to tell us. It's not saying, oh, since Jesus picks up a sword and kills people, if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to pick up a sword and kill people. No, if we're going to follow Jesus, then we die. We sacrifice. That's what it means to follow Jesus. So, that's how Jesus enters the stage, and when he enters the stage, the stage is clear, and these characters, the beast and the false prophet, are going to disappear from the story. But then in chapter 20, it's got another strange image, and I want to try to talk about this quickly and not, not give a lot of details. And, and the first thing I want to say about Revelation chapter 20 is that it's, uh, no one, I think, really knows exactly what's going on here. Now, I mean, John Woods is going to preach in, in two weeks of the, the final sermon, you know, and he said about chapter 20, no one really knows what's happening here. And even one of the, the, the better commentaries that uh, I was reading this week, um, you know, it's, it's, in these particular chapters, you can tell his tone really changes. 
He, he, he really does a good job of saying, I think this is what's happening. This makes a little more sense than other views. But I appreciate his humility to say that this is, this is really hard. There's some details here that don't, don't necessarily fit in in the system. And so, I mean, what, what we have here is the beast and the false prophet, they're sent to the lake of fire. And they're, they're there forever and ever. And then in chapter 20, um, an angel comes and he's got a key to, a, to the abyss. It's again this kind of uh, image of under the earth, not necessarily literally under the earth, where you know evil spirits and evil people are consigned. And it says he seizes the dragon, that ancient serpent, serpent who is the devil and Satan, and he binds him for a thousand years. So you have this image of Satan now is bound for a thousand years. But then after a thousand years, he's let loose, and once again, Satan is free to tempt people to rebel against God, and so you have another scene of people rising up against God, and then you have, once again, another scene of judgment, and then even Satan, this dragon, is, is bound where the beast and the false prophet is. So what's going on now? I mean, that, that's a really hard text. Is this something that's literally going to happen? Is there really some time in the future that then Satan will be bound and then there will be some kind of special thousand years of perfection but then he's going to be loosed again? And of course, that's one interpretation and that, that fits some of the details of the text and of course there's really good scholars who believe that. I myself don't think that that's what's going on here, that that's what this thousand years is about. For one thing, to me, and again, this is just a subjective feeling, it's a, I, I ask, what kind of game is God playing at that he would bind Satan, defeat Satan, and then let him loose again to deceive a bunch of people again, you know, so that those people become enemies of God again and experience judgment. To me, that doesn't fit what, what I see God doing there. But another reason why I'm not sure that's what's going on there is, you know, the, the scene of Satan being bound, we've already talked about that a little bit, and there's, you know, in the Bible there's different times when you have that image, when Satan is cast out of heaven, you know, or when he's limited in this way. And so there's, there's a question mark in the Bible about exactly when does this event happen and what does it look like. The other reason why I take whatever John is saying here to be an image about now, a picture of present reality as he talks about, you know, these, these saints that are existing, that they are priests and they are reigning with Jesus. But those words are used for, for us. They're not just a word for people in the future. We are, as we saw in 1 Peter, we are priests and rulers. We are a kingdom of priests. Um, and, and, and that's for now. That's who God's people are. So I, for I myself, I, I think what John is doing in, in, in these verses is just, it's a way of uh, communicating how relentlessly Satan fights against God. So even if you have this image that he's bound, you know, you would think he would have learned his lesson and realized he can't defeat Jesus. And so this, I, I think this image is communicating that no, he's just relentlessly the enemy of Jesus. And he would rather lose than submit to Jesus. And then the fact that he can deceive some people and they might be deceived or rebel against God is just a way of communicating, you know, the nature of our human hearts. We are bent toward being deceived. You know, we, 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 um, We're still not straightened out. You know, we're still in danger of, you know, of going our own way, of turning our backs on God. And, and that's, that's, that's a human heart. Until we are fixed completely, we need to be humble enough to admit that, yeah, we, we could still be deceived. We could still be deceived. Whoever we are. You know, I mean, I, I've... I've been around for a few years, and I've been in church my entire life, 
You know, and I've got lots of seminary classes behind me, lots of books read, and way too many sermons preached. But that's no guarantee about me. It's no guarantee. People older than I, who've been more faithful than I, have come to the end of their lives and taken a wrong turning, and even turned their backs on Jesus. That's the nature of our human hearts right now. It's why we need to take care of our souls. So I think that's, that's what John is doing here. He's in between sections. He's communicating first the end of these characters. They've been on the stage. They've had their time. You know, they've had their is it 15 minutes or 15 seconds of fame? They've had their 15 minutes or 15,000 years on the stage. But they're gone. They're swept off the stage. And it's the end of the story for them. So that brings us to these two ends, this tension that I want to talk about. So beginning of chapter 19, John says, After these things I heard something like the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God, because the judgments are true and righteous. He has judged the great prostitute who is corrupting the earth with her sexual immorality. He has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And the second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders, the four living creatures, these, you know, these ones who are gathered around the throne that we've seen a few times in Revelation. They fell down, they worship God who sits on the throne, they say, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. By the way, you know, that, that, that's your voice. We just sang those words. You know, we sang the words, Hallelujah, God reigns. This is your voices. You know, if you wondered if you were in the book of Revelation, I want to suggest there you are. You, you actually are there. You have a voice in this story, and this is your voice, and you practice your voice this morning. So salvation comes, and of course, it, but salvation still includes judgment, because that's, you know, evil has to be destroyed. It's not good news if evil persists. It's not good news if injustice persists. Salvation partially consists in wiping out the injustice and bringing justice, and so this is part of the salvation that Jesus brings. And the Lord God Almighty, He reigns through His Son, Jesus. And then another image comes up in the next couple of verses, and this is going to be fleshed out next Sunday. So it says, Let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has prepared herself. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The saints are marked by the righteous acts. At the same time, they're given to her. They are not necessarily natural to her, but they are given to her. And he said to be right. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And this, you know, this is going to come to fulfillment or fruition in the next chapter, but it's this amazing image of, of the unity between Jesus and his people. So Jesus enters the stage, and he's so overwhelming that the stage is clear, and all those other characters exit. But Jesus himself makes room for another character. And it's going to be his bride. That's how much he loves his people. This is 
this is the good news. There's actually good news in that judgment, but the amazing good news is this, that there are people who are his people, and that Jesus wants to be with them. And then the other end of the story is a very different kind of image, in the end of chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and the heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. That's scary. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged for the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. The thought of that book even existing scares me. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. That's as if to say there's, there's no one escapes this. There's no human being that's going to get away from this judgment. Whoever they are, However they die, wherever their body ended up, they're going to be raised to stand before this throne and face this judgment. And they were judged, each one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death of the lake of fire. This is, this is the final death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. <clears throat> this, I mean, if you're, if you're a sensitive kind of person, uh, this, this ought to create some tension in you. I mean, the, this picture, you know, of this, this final judgment, it ought to make us feel uncomfortable. And, and this is, I think this is a necessary tension. This is a tension that that John is trying to create all through the book of Revelation. And what John is trying to communicate here is that in the end, we all have to choose. We have to choose which side we're going to be on. And, and John, when he paints his picture, he paints things very black and white. And we talk about how the fact that, you know, real life often looks like gray. And, and, and we know ourselves to be not... We're not totally evil, we don't think, but we know we're not totally righteous, and so we, we might see ourselves kind of in between, and we often try to live in between two worlds. But one of the things John is trying to do in creating this tension is to say, in the end, we have to choose a side. Either our name is written in this book, or it's not written in this book. And I, I, don't develop some kind of big theology about what this book is. It's an image to say you either belong to God's people and you're written there or you don't. And if you wonder where you're written, it's a way of saying it's your choice. Choose. Choose which book you want to be written in, where you want to be. You've got, you've got to choose. So this, this is the tension John is creating. He's creating it intentionally. He wants us to feel uncomfortable because he is saying in the end you've got to choose a side. You can't remain neutral forever. You've got to choose it. And if Jesus is your king then it's got to be Jesus and you just have to follow him. And in the end you've got to say no to all the other kings and all the other values all the other allegiances. You, you have to choose. And so I just want to say Say to you and to you who might be, you know, watching at home, what are you going to choose? Who, in the end, who, who is it going to be? Who's going to be your Lord? Who you're going to have to turn your back on if Jesus is going to be your Lord? You, you have to make a choice at some point. You can't remain neutral forever. In this scene, there's no neutrality. Your name is written in that book, or it's not. And we have to choose. So that, that's part of the necessary tension that I think John is creating here. <clears throat> but there's a second kind of necessary tension that I want to, to talk about as we, we finish up here. 
Uh, and it's again what we go back here. <coughs> Years ago, uh, I, I worked at a Christian camp. And there's lots of things, you know, that would be differently at that camp. But one of the things we did with the kids is we made them memorize a lot of Bible verses. I don't, you know, I don't know if that is good or bad. It was good for me because I, I ended up having to memorize a lot of Bible verses. I'm, I'm glad about that. But that was one of the things, you know, in the course of a week, those poor kids had to memorize like 15, 20 Bible verses. And I don't know if they remembered afterwards. But, um, you know, sometimes I would choose some of the Bible verses that they would memorize, and, and several times I had these kids memorize these verses. I, I don't know what the heck I was thinking. <laughs> well, I didn't know what I was thinking, and, I, and uh, it was stupid. But, but I had in mind back then the kind of the message that we all need to hear is judgment. And somehow, if these kids memorize these verses, that that might somehow steer them straight. And the main thing they need to know about God is that God is, might get them, so they better straighten up. And so I, you know, back in those days, that was kind of a, a major message for me. You know, when in doubt about what to preach about, preach about judgment. You know, you can never go wrong if you preach about judgment. Um, I'm so thankful that God was patient and continued to change my heart and mind. But that was kind of one end of just mainly all judgment. You just got people need to hear that judgment. And the main message is you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And you better do something so you don't go to hell because you're on the verge of hell and you don't want to go to hell. So do something so you don't go to hell. Because hell is just the main focus of your life, you want to avoid going to hell. But that's, that's there. It's there in Revelation 20, but then there's this other passage that we looked at, and somehow we need to keep this tension, because that tension is necessary. If we're going to move forward, tension is a good thing. Okay? And I know there's some engineers out there, and you can much better explain the importance of tension and you could give more examples of where, you know, we need to maintain tension. If you lose tension, everything falls apart. Okay? And so we need to find some way to maintain the tension between these two messages. There's the message of judgment, and it's there. It's part of the true word of God. But then there's also this message of grace and the goodness of God and this, this picture of of Jesus inviting others up on the stage with him. We've got to maintain that. And, and this is what's so hard, is to somehow keep, keep grace and judgment together and not completely lose sight of one. And, and often in the history of the church and, and in churches now, you know, there's some that are mainly one, some that are mainly the other. And of course, as I'll talk about in a moment, we have our own kind of way here at Communitas of, of, of holding these, these, these together, and it's not easy. But somehow we need to maintain this tension. We need to find a way to highlight the grace of God and the beauty of Jesus. You know, at the same time, admitting the fact that there's consequences to rejecting that message. We've got to hold on to both of these. We've actually talked about this before. If you were here in the Exodus series, one of the verses that we looked at several times in that series is, is one of something I think easily the most important revelation in all of the Bible. And one of the reasons this is so important is because this is where God, God speaks. And God communicates His theology, what He wants people to believe about Him. Exodus 34, Then the Lord, Yahweh, came down in the cloud, and He stood there with Him, and proclaimed His name, Yahweh, the Lord. And He passed in front of Moses, 
Remember that scene. That's another one of those scenes where God is on the stage in the sense Moses is invited on the stage with him. It's really an amazing scene there. And so, the Lord proclaims, the Lord, the Lord. And this is the main thing he says about himself. Compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And if you remember that sermon, I'm sure you don't, so it's okay if you've forgotten. But if you remember, um, at least seven more times in the Old Testament, those words are used again. It's kind of the central creed of the Old Testament. It's compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So if, if there's anything that summarizes God, even the God of the Old Testament, who's the same God of Jesus Christ, it's that. He's a compassionate and gracious God. And he's actually slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. And he maintains love to a thousand. But as we talk about then, a thousand generations, he maintains love. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. We see a lot of wickedness, rebellion, and sin in the book of Revelation, but we know that God forgives that. But he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children, the sin of the parents, to the third and fourth Generation. I'm not going to repeat kind of my explanation uh, about that. It's not that, you know, just because my grandfather did something that then automatically God might punish me for my grandfather's sin. It's a way of saying, if I perpetuate, if I continue the sin of my grandfather, then I too will be judged like my grandfather, great-grandfather was. But what's important here is that contrast to the third and fourth generation, contrast that, maintaining love to a thousand generations. It's an amazing balance that is communicated here. Both of them are in the picture. But clearly, clearly the emphasis is on the Lord, compassionate and gracious, abounding in love, and forgiveness. So we can't forget the other. other. And we can't just let that go. We've got to hold on to it. But the primary message is still this gracious God. So I've, I've said here, you know, at Communitas, we want to try to keep, you know, grace and law, grace and judgment, you know, in our sight and in our hands, but but we are are always going to default toward the grace of God and the love of God. I can't I can't just you know throw out law and the rules, but our default setting is not we just got to focus on the rules and on judgment. That's not our default setting. That's not our first response. We're not bent toward legalism here. And that, that's hard. I mean, I, I'm telling you that it's hard in practice because when you have to deal with people's lives and the, the mess that they are in, the mess that we are in, the, the mess that I am in, and you've got to sort out, can they do this, should they do that, or who's actually allowed to come? I mean, I've had that discussion in the history of this church, is so and so allowed to come because of this, and is so and so allowed to come because of this? They have this problem, they have this sin. And it's hard, it's hard to know. And, and, and I've made people uncomfortable, and not everyone, you know, not even, you know, central people in this church are always happy with, with our choices. And I've had people tell me, you know, you're too nice, Mark, you need to crack down more. And maybe I do. Maybe I do. But if I'm, if I'm going to default, if I'm going to fall one way or another, okay, I'm falling toward the grace and love of God. 
And I've got to try to maintain that tension. I'm not throwing out rules. I'm not saying everything is okay. But, but this, this creates tension. And, and for me, who I'm always second guessing, I, I, there's very few things I've ever done in the history of this church where afterwards I thought that was just the right thing. Most of the things are like, well, I hope that was the best. I don't know. I, 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 we, we did the best that we could. I hope it was the right choice. I, I'm not 100% certain. We're just trying to, trying to make it through and muddle through. But it's our attempt to hold on, to live in this tension to both, to both sides. And so that's the other necessary tension. Okay? And, and it, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy until, again, Jesus clears the stage until we ourselves you know, are thoroughly cleansed and transformed. So those are kind of two necessary tensions that we need to hang on to. Before we finish, once again though, where we are in the story, where we are in Revelation, this is a big turning that we just looked at where a lot of characters exit the stage, but this moment is not the end. We're still not at the end of the story. We're at the end of something. Something ends, you know, with this defeat of Satan and the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. But that blue line is going on. We're not at the end of the story. And the end of the story is amazing. It ends good, you know, in case you wonder. I don't, I, I actually sometimes don't watch I mean, I've said it before, I often check out spoilers, you know, I, there's a film I'm going to watch, I go to IMDb, and I get the plot, you know, and I find out if there's a man to do it or bad, and I, when I was younger, I had a higher tolerance for bad endings, or sometimes, you know, I read the end of the film, and it's like, I'm not going to bother, I don't want to mess with the bad ending, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with me, but the good news, the story ends well, read Revelation to Okay, we're not at the end yet. Come back. Come back to the end of the story. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge. Thank you for the confrontation that puts before our eyes. I pray that we would take that seriously. But I pray, Lord, as we read Revelation, as we read the rest of the Bible, and especially as we look at Jesus, who rules with a rod of iron, but what that actually looks like is a lamb who is willing to die for us. Give us that vision, Lord, may we hang on to that, and may that cause us to be faithful witnesses.